three, two, one, zero, zero, and lift off. Welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's podcast on all things branding and digital marketing. Since 2008, Peralta Design has launched hundreds of brands with award-winning identities and websites. Join our hosts Ramon and Jorge as they use decades of combined experience to tackle topics with past clients, industry partners, and the rest of the PD crew. At Peralta Design, we launch brands. But for now, let's launch right into this episode of Mission Control. Hey everybody, welcome to Mission Control, where we respect the grind and reclaim the American dream. I am your host, Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design, and we launch brands. Today's guest, I'm proud to say he's a fellow brother in Alpha who is held in high esteem across the country for his roles in education as a servant leader and family-focused leadership. He is the immediate past interim president of Harris Stowe State University, And he's quickly embedded himself here in the greater Bridgeport community, already making a tremendous impact. Dr. Smith serves as a chair of the board of the Higher Education Consortium, was appointed by the Missouri Commissioner of Higher Education to the President's Advisory Council, and was named recently to the U.S. Department of State Fulbright Specialist Program. Please help me welcome the CEO of Housatonic Community College, Dr. Dwayne Smith. Welcome. Thank you, Brother Peralta. That was that was amazing. <laughs> I feel important here. You bet you you sure are. And you should feel that way. Yeah. So tell us, first of all, thank you for being here, but tell us, tell the audience your backstory. Sure. So um first of all, I'm I'm just delighted to be here, you know, in your presence and what you're doing here. Uh I'm new to uh Connecticut. And my backstory is interesting, I would say. Um, born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, under horrific poverty. And that's how I'll describe it. Uh, my, uh, my mother was the granddaughter, or the daughter, a sharecropper. So I'm the grandson of sharecroppers. And sharecropping is what black folks did in Mississippi in the South. And so because of Jim Crow law, she didn't have opportunities. And so... Uh, the white, all white school board decided that blacks didn't need education. They cut the 12th grade. So basically, literally, all the blacks in that town, the segregated town, the segregated schools, didn't have a high school diploma. But my mother believes so much in education that she, com- she completed the 11th grade twice. Wow. And um, she came through the Great Migration, if you understand. This is Black History Month, so I'm kind of yes. doing a little schooling. So during the Great Migration where uh, the millions of African Americans left the South to the North, and this is considered the North. And so she settled in St. Louis, but without any type of skills, mm-hmm. we wound up on welfare and, you know, and uh, just, again, it was horrific. We lived in buildings that should have been condemned, uh, and she believed in education. And so with seven of us, and we have over 10 college degrees. And so for me, that's an amazing story of triumph. And so I always go back to that. Um, to let me know I'm a bad brother. Right. And I got through this. <laughs> yes. And so that's what I like to do, inspire other people, you know. And so went off to college, and I believe that education can transform one's life. So this has been my entire journey. Uh, my whole in- entire career is education. But pardon my ignorance, and I caught the fact that the law was to legally prevent blacks from attaining a high school diploma by – Ending their, their high school career at the 11th grade? Sure. So we talk about institutional uh, racism. You know, so I'm uh, trying not to be all over the place. But right now, the discussion is about critical race theory. Mm-hmm. And so real, cr- critical race theory really looks at the constructs of race through the lens of laws. So it's not about individual people liking or disliking people, but it's about systems that kept people at bay and promoted other groups of people. And so in the Jim Crow South where most African Americans lived, there was harsh laws and really customs that were designed to keep African Americans at bay. So one of the things I remember my aunt, she, she'd be 90, all, all my, my mother's 10 siblings, including her, my mother, are deceased with the exception of one. She was the youngest. She'd be 90 this year. And she would talk about how they would walk to school and the whites would have a, the school bus. And she would say that you had, you had to jump into – kind of like the levy because what the kids would do, they would put pins in 
paper airplanes and throw them out the window. And so if you was unlucky, those things would hit you. And so those kind of things that was condoned legally, it wasn't the fact that these kids were mean, but it was, it was condoned by the system. And most um, African-Americans were illiterate. And so fortunately, my grandfather, who was born in 1892, he was actually illiterate. And that says a whole lot. My father, he only had a third grade education because they picked cotton. So most African-Americans during that time period only had like a third grade education. But when you, if you were able to graduate from high school, it's almost graduating from college because right. of the opportunities. But the white school board determined that blacks did not need the 12th grade because they picked cotton. And they could pick cotton throughout the year. And so that's what happened to my mother's uh, family in Tugwell, Mississippi. Wow. So how did you overcome that? Starting, you're already starting out at a disadvantage with that, that legacy. Yeah. What was it like growing up where, you know, where, did, where do you think the change happened in your, in your family's history? Well, you know, one of the things that my mother didn't have a whole lot and I really just what I remember most about growing up was this belief that things would get better, mm-hmm. and so I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would have these almost kind of, I would almost kind of remove myself from my body, and I'd be watching these images of me being successful, you know. So I'm dating myself, but the show that was out during the time was the Beverly Hillbillies, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so the Beverly Hillbillies they had a mansion, black you know? and white with the oil and all that. Yeah, yeah. But this. I would see myself yeah. in that mansion. Okay. It's almost I was superposed to the show, and I'd be <laughs> black me in there, you know, and leave it to Beaver. That was the show. You're like, they right. had a nice home, picket fence, right. that sort of thing. But the horror that I dealt with was that we had, like, times we, had, we didn't have a refrigerator, right? And so we would use a trash can to put our food in. Wow. A trash can is for trash, but we put our food in that. And then when, when the furnace was out, we would all live in the kitchen, and use the heat, and you know, and, and you know, living in buildings that, um, again, people should have lived in those buildings. But I always kind of felt like things would get better. But it was so harsh because there, and this, this really is my sensibility now. When I volunteer, I have a, a, a utmost respect for those who are low wealth. I don't call them poor, but low wealth, because I just remember being in these food lines and people being so disrespectful. As a poor person, you're invisible. So there's a lot, particularly as a um, a poor black person, there's a lot that that knocks you to your knees. But I believe it was like my mother refused to bow down. Mm. I never saw my mother cry. And I remember I had, I had a Jewish friend, and I told her that story. And she said, that's really sad that your mother didn't cry. And I, and I said, my mother couldn't afford to cry because she has <laughs> But I, I got her point years later, but it was more or less uh, rolling up her sleeves. This is what we need to do. And I, I would say that my oldest brother, uh, who's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, he set the standard because he would go out and shovel snow, and he would give my mother half his, uh, his earnings. And he continued that, right? He, just, I mean, he, he never forgot about us. It was about how do we lift the entire family up. Mm-hmm. My mother was, uh, I would say she was an entrepreneur, um, we didn't call it that way, but she hustled. So she sold. So she made, so we was very poor, but we had nice clothes because she sold. But she also sold for, for people in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I remember, tur- you know what turbans are, but in yeah. the 70s, turbans were really. Head wraps. And, and head wraps. So, but, yeah. we, but turbans were very popular because of the black exploitation movies. Uh, the women wore turbans. So she got a hustle. She would get material for 50 cent and then sell the turbans for $2. But, but she was selling uh, cheaper than they were in the store. Like the, the store, like five dollars, and I would go hustle on the street corner. You want some turbans, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it was that kind of um, belief that things would get better. And even today, my 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 mantra is the hustle makes the difference. The hustle makes the difference. So that's what we did. We hustled, and then my brother he graduated first, and he went off to college, and he said set the standard for everybody, and he was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And what he did. He started sending my mother half his paycheck. He actually went to Korea. He said, the reason why I went to Korea is because he called, we call my mother mama. He said mother. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, the reason I went to Korea, I was trying to figure out how can I live on, um, I think it was like uh, $300 a month. Because he was a second lieutenant, graduate from college, but his pay was uh, $600. So how profound is that, that he's like, he's off on his own 
and he's sending my mother $300 a month. So the first thing that happened was that we didn't run out of food. That was always the fear, running out of food. You know, we were still on welfare, right? <laughs> and so he was sending the $300. Then a few years later, he bought my mother a brand new home, brand wow. spanking new. Wow. You know, we were the first to move in this home. And it's, and, and I consider ourselves a Beverly Hillbillies because we didn't know about dishwasher, you know. Right. So my brother thought, I'm going to wash the dishes. He put dishwasher liquid <laughs> and not, you know, he put dishwasher detergent. And so when you do that. You get all the foam. Foam is everywhere. <laughs> right. You're like, this thing is broken. <laughs> you know, and then also other pieces. And this is really the, 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 the implications of growing up with lack because you don't learn certain sensibilities. Mm. So our home was so uh, d- dilapidated, we never had friends over. We could never say, okay, come over after school. And, the, and, the, right. and my friends kind of knew that. So it was like, Dwayne, we want to go use the restroom. No, you can't use the restroom. You know, because our restroom, for instance, you could see the basement because of the floor. I mean, so was that. Right. But so when we got our home, we had to learn how to entertain people in the home, you know. And it just carried on. So then I have a sister, she's deceased now, but she's an attorney and sister went to medical school, you know. I mean, so we're talking about this is what my mother produced. She moved, and my brother, he got the Navy, uh, Army as a major, but she produced um, um, a college president, attorney, a social worker, all of this coming from a perspective of not having opportunities. Right. What do you think she instilled in you? Is it? Not squandering her sacrifices, or was there? How did how did she embed this this sense of uh, the self fulfilling prophecy? You mentioned seeing yourself in an out of body experience. How did yeah. you think she instilled that, and how can we instill that in young people today? So I say the first thing my mother did is that she never said you couldn't do anything. So if you came to her and said I'm gonna be a teacher, she didn't say you can't be a teacher because you don't have this background. She said okay, you can be a teacher. When my sister said, I want to be a doctor, she didn't say, you can't be a doctor. Go and be a doctor. It's just that simple thing that you, you, you uh, move the barriers. You know, I, I call it unconditional belief mm-hmm. and abilities and possibilities. So that's really the one thing she still does. She is still really a sense of pride. So there's a discussion right now about the N-word, you know. Who can use the N-word? I've never used the N-word. Well, I take that back. The only time I use the N-word I used to DJ in college, <laughs> right? And so I had the, the – You still DJ, by the way, because I saw the flyer. Well, <laughs> well that's Guess not really, DJ. Well, see, DJing at a party is different. You're trying to get the people up, so you, you may not like a song, but you know it's going to jump the party, right? Right. <laughs> Well, when I was DJing, I was just putting my favorite songs out there, so I was hoping you would like us. So I had like Esther Roll you know, <laughs> from Good Times on my playlist. But the point is, is that so I was at a, I was DJ, and I thought I was DJing at the, the frat party, mm. and so uh, I can say now, so the cap was just trying to sneak in. Mm. So they, and my nickname was BB. So it came to me on the DJ stand and said, "BB, the cap was trying to sneak in," and I got on the mic said, "Whoever's sneaking in, you need to pay." Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure what happened, but I said, that's ends for you. And I had a sense of shame. Mm-hmm. When I said it, I was so embarrassed by it. And I've never said it. I never, ever said the word again. And my mother never, ever said it. My mother died when she was 88 years old. Did never. anybody ever call you that growing up? Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the thing, you know, claiming your space. So I was always... Um, I always had to hustle. So I put my, back in the day, you could put your name up, you know, I mean, not the name, but your age. And so instead of being 16, I was, I was 14 until my, I was 16. So I was working Mm -hmm. as a 14, 50 year old. And so I used to work on the South side of St. Louis, which is now predominantly African American, but at that point it was predominantly white. And so I would catch the bus in the evening and invariably somebody would pass by, they would honk and say, and go back to Africa. Or just go back to Africa. Whatever the pejorative is, they was trying to remind me of my place. And so when I first heard it, I was just like shocked. Did they just call me that? <laughs> you know. But it became just part of the routine, you know. And so just dealing with all types of, uh, uh, I just wasn't going to be broken, right? right? Uh, and so it's N word. You know, I had my first interaction with the police, being uh, uh, you know shaken down, and uh, when I was sixteen, you know. So it's it's just cyclical, but just being able to overcome that and be a, not a, oh, just a 
uh, uh, surviving that but being thriving, overcoming those sort of things. All right, the, the, and just being resilient and, and the, the positive it. affirmations, believing in yourself. Right, right. So, you know, I always say that there's something that's going to challenge you. And once you get past that challenge, you can always go back to that thing and understand if I made that, I can make anything. And mine was very simply football. I really didn't play football, but I had a kind of football players building. So these these friends of mine, these girls say, you should play football. (laughs) Were you like the blind side where they were like teaching you? Well, how to play, but no, the night they went through, but still, so so the time I grew up, you know, basically that's what people did, and so I mean, we had that was a way out, possibly. Well, well, way out, but basically, people like was superstars. So, we from our school alone, we had um, brother that went to the, the Celtics, okay, you know, went to Chicago Bears. You don't find that in school, but it was that competitive, you know, and so here I am, decided I'm gonna play football. And it was a, it was a, the most difficult thing I had in my life to do. And I remember every day, this is B team, this is my sophomore year, and every day I said, I'm going to quit. <laughs> and I said, today is going to be the day that I'm going to quit. And I kept going. And so I remember it was just a harsh day. I mean, we, uh, no, harsh, just harsh. It was just, just no, we, the physical. The physical, yeah. but just the mental. I mean, you know, work at, <laughs> I mean, the inner city schools ain't no joke, you know. And so I remember walking to the bus stop. I didn't have any money. I was so dejected. I said, this is it. And I was so tired. I couldn't, because I lived about three miles from home, from, from school. And I said, what am I going to do? So I sat at the bus stop, not having any money, <laughs> figuring out, okay, the bus going to come. What am I going to do? And so I said, God, send me a sign I shouldn't quit. And as soon as I said that, my sixth grade teacher pulled up and said, Dwayne, is that you? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's me. And she said, you want to ride home? And just that simple thing that said, you want to ride home? And I said, I'm going to give me another day. And at the end of the, we were like uh, undefeated, you know. Um, and we wound up years later winning the championship. But at the end of the, the, the season, we were like playing the championship game. We lost the championship game. But the coach, Coach Brown, who I'm dear to this very day, he said, you know, I thought BB was going to quit. And I was expecting him to quit, but he's here today, and we can learn a lot of, from that, you know. And I was like, "Wow!" He's like, "Yeah, BB." <laughs> <You know? laughs> and from that point on, that next year, I said, "You know, I need to play varsity, but I need a car." And so that's when I I turned sixteen, really turned sixteen, mm-hmm. and so I I just took driver's lessons, which is kind of you know people I didn't have anybody teach me how to drive, right? right. So I took driving lessons, got a car. And went all the way through to my senior year and graduated. And so I always say, what's the pivotal moment for you? It was that. And so when I play as a fraternity, it's going to be hard. It was hard, but I'm like, you know what? If I made the sophomore year, I can make anything. And to this very day, that was like, what, God, 1976. But I can go back to 1976 and say, you know, that was the hardest thing I did in my entire life. And I persevered. And that's what I do. And I tell my kids, my daughter went through some very uh, difficult racial difficulty in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is going to be pivotal for you because they tried to destroy her. And she came out smoking. And I said, you're going to look at that and you're going to see that's going to be pivotal that you're not going to quit anything because of that. And people need to learn that. They understand that. What is the thing that you thought was going to break you that was going to cause you to give up, but you got through it? You got to go back to that place, right? Because what happens is everything becomes another difficulty. So I learned the lesson in 1976. You know, what drew you to Alpha? I know your brother was an Alpha, but did you have, did you look at any of the other fraternities? Yeah. So so it, it, I worked. I went, went to Truman State, well, Northeast Missouri State University. They changed the name. Truman State University, and it was a predominantly white campus in rural Missouri. And so I knew my brother was popular there because I started school as two years after he graduated. So I made sure I, was gonna, I wasn't going to tell anybody that my brother was an alpha. And so I joined the gospel choir, which is a fantastic thing. So at the break, back in the day, we had uh, little sisters. I don't know if you – Alpha Angels. We had Alpha Angels on campus Okay, as well, okay. Yeah. Yes, we had Alpha Angels. So this Halos. Well, we call them Alpha Angels. So the Alpha Angels. Uh, well, right. we had they were Halos while we were online, and then oh, they became right. Angels after. That's right. 
Well, y'all did it illegal because they supposed to be outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is 1989, so they've been locked. Statue well, okay. limitations. Right, right, right. <laughs> but this Alpha Angel came up just talking to me like, "Where you from?" You know right. that kind of thing. <laughs> and I was like, "I'm from St. Louis, Missouri." And, she, and I said something like, my brother went to school here. And, and she said, what's your brother? I said, Cornell Smith. She went crazy. Oh, yeah. She said, the Wizard of Corn, he was, he was named the Wizard of Corn, you know, Corn, who does all, sees all, something real. He had a greeting. Yeah, right. like, the Wizard of Corn, who does all, see all. And mm-hmm. we used to make fun of him when he'd come home with that stuff, because we didn't understand that right. stuff. And so she went back and told the Alphas. It was like I was a mini celebrity, right? Oh, wow. Because he had pledged. But that can backfire. Well, that's why, you know, but what it was, it, it, uh, they said, we knew you was coming up here. I'm like, you didn't know because I didn't know. Right. But, you know, but I looked at all the fraternities, but they had this sense of leadership. Mm-hmm. Like, back in the day, this is the 70s and the 80s where fraternities were really big. So on, on our campus, we had like about, mine about 20-some fraternities. Yeah. And they would always produce, print the GPAs on the front page of the school newspaper. <laughs> And so the, and the alpha, alphas had the best ones. Well, alphas number two out Ooh. of like twenty, okay. And all the other frats, they were like at the bottom. You know, I thought it was yeah. kind of embarrassing. Like the, the the average GPA of this group was like a one point seven. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and so so I just saw them doing a lot of things, yeah. and and I always say that um, the fraternity really helped me in my leadership. So when mm-hmm. I went off to college, I was literally transformed. So all that stuff, you know. So I kind of talked to them in a breezy kind of way. I was poor and I did this. But it was harsh, mm-hmm. and I was embarrassed. I always had shame about stuff, you know. And so when I got to college, that freshman year was totally transformed. I came out a different kind of person, totally different. You know, I was really passive. People could say anything to me, that sort of thing. When I came back, I was on fire. I came back the summer of uh, 80, daring somebody to do stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I'm saying, you know, <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So, you know, so again, I was bullied because you can't be sensitive in those neighborhoods. People give me your money or they call you names, whatever, you know. Or well, make fun of your shoes or your clothes yeah. or whatever. Matter, matter of fact, yeah, yeah. So my nickname is BB. I won't go into detail. Is it BB King or? It's BB. There was another <laughs> woman. Because your initials are DS, so I'm I, trying to figure out well, where is this coming from. Well, it's BB. It, I, was, I was sophomore B team, and so these guys on varsity, they was making fun of this woman in, a, in the same advisory group. And they called her BB, and I won't. It was a pejorative. Okay, gotcha. So on the bus, we you know we did like a half day at one school, half day, and so they would say, "I figured it out by yeah, now." BB got a <laughs> a girlfriend, and I'm thinking, I don't know who BB is, right? But it was me. So they say, "Look at BB's shoes," and they laugh, and I'm laughing. Oh, I'm laughing myself, right? <laughs> they talking about BB. <laughs> look at BB's shirt, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, look at his shirt." <laughs> And so one day I was late for practice, so I had to run over to the varsity, from the varsity to the B team line. Yeah. They were like, BB, BB. I'm like, I'm BB. And they're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm BB. You know? But while, what it wound up doing, it wound up uh, giving me, because uh, most people didn't know, the football team knew what it stood for, but most mm-hmm. people just called me BB. So I went off to college, and uh, people from college, from high school went to college with me. They called me BB, you know. But but the main thing really is that I was literally transformed. So that summer, I remember I just had to catch the bus, and I was always giving speeches. <laughs> so I'm on the bus talking about, uh, and this is like a city bus where I'm saying, you all need to do better, blah, blah, blah. And my sister's like, shut up, what you doing? You know, she's like shocked, you know. But that's the fire I had. So the sophomore year I came back, uh, the fraternity gave me organizational skills. Mm-hmm. I had that passion. I had the grassroots, but I didn't have the organization. And even to this day, like two weeks ago, the president of my chapter, when I was undergrad, he retired as a colonel. And, you know, he's still in the frat. Uh, he just won a uh, brother year in his, you know, in his chapter in um, North Carolina. And I called him and said, I want to thank you, you know, because I got a whole lot from you and the other brothers. And he's like, oh, no, BB. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, Man, you, you showed me a whole lot, and it really helps me, even at Housatonic, those skill sets, how to organize, how to motivate, how right. to uh, synthesize things. It came from. Right. Well, I want to keep us on track because yeah, yeah. you mentioned <clears throat> transformation as a theme and adversity, overcoming adversities. Yes. You certainly overcame it just in 
where you started and, and now you're in college. And, and um, I want to, I want you to share a little bit about the adversity that, you know, how do you met your wife and, and how you, and the adversity you dealt with just as an early family. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So basically um, I became a student activist and, mm-hmm. but I wasn't a scholar. I barely, I barely graduated, you know, uh, had a low GPA because I was sitting at a table when I was supposed to be in class, but I gained uh, admiration as uh, a leader. As a leader, I mean, from the, from the university, from the students. So when I was hired, I was an activist. I was a student one month. Next month, I was hired as a staff member to to serve and help student retention. So I had people GPA. So for undergraduates, that's the most personal right. thing you would have with their GPA. But they trusted me so much, you know, and I just hustled and did a whole lot of things, you know. And so I realized that I could still move forward just with a low GPA. I wouldn't recommend people to get a low GPA, but I had to overcome that. And it really overcome the stigma of that, you know, that people thought because of how I carried myself, I must have had a 3.5. I must have, and I was far from that. But I was always thinking big, you know, thinking big, you know. So when I early started my career, I would apply for, like, White House fellowships, right? <laughs> White House fellows, these, these are former Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to apply for it, you know. And I wouldn't get it, of course, but I never was, uh, I was undaunted by it. I wasn't, the notion of failure was, that's part of the process of taking risks and doing things. And so uh, I applied for like a, 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 a Harvard year-long fellowship. I didn't get that. Then I fought, applied for a Harvard develop, Management Development Program. I got that, you know. And I was one of the youngest people in that. And so that was always my, that was my stir up, that I was always thinking bigger. And I became a Fulbright scholar because I said I could be a Fulbright scholar. I could apply for that. And even in my mind, I said I could be a, I could be a university president, but there was a lot of things, pitfalls in that. And so going to that story, so when I got married, we kind of flew very high, me and my wife. You know, she was finishing up grad school and I was finishing up my PhD. And so I was a faculty member uh, and she was um, – Products man, she 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 had had leadership over like a twenty to twenty five million dollar line at Hallmark, you know, and so we had this picture perfect kind of like Cosby kind of thing with these two professionals. And I remember before everything kind of the rug was pulled out that our we take vacations, you know, so we went to to Hollywood and we were staying at the the Hilton, Beverly Hilton, you know, where. Uh, Whitney Houston died. <laughs> you know, we got a little some discounts, but that's what we were hanging. And so, like different movie stars were hanging out in the hallway, you know, in the lobby. And I'm telling my, I wasn't gonna rush up to him, but I was telling my kids, "There's so and so, so and so," you know. So that's how we were living, you know. And then the next year, my last daughter rubbing you know, elbows with celebrities. And- well, I wasn't rubbing. I was just looking at them because. <laughs> <you know, laughs> I, you know, cause I don't get in that kind of stuff. I've seen somebody. I'm not like, can I take a picture? You know, right. but but my kids was a big kick for them, you know, right, to see right. these different people, you know. But but my point is that, you know, everything was smooth until it wasn't, you know. And so for various reasons, my wife lost her job that May, and then that June I lost mine. And I just said, okay, it's going to be all right because I've been working since I was 14, mm-hmm. you know. And I just figured it'd be, it won't be any problem getting, getting a job, and it was. It was, I mean, so everything – uh, like uh, really un- unemployment kind of covered almost our mortgage because it was just two of us and then unemployment ran out and then we had some, some savings that ran out and then it was just me hustling. And one of the things I realized, say, you know what? I had to go back to my mother, how she never broke. Mm-hmm. I had to, I mean, really literally I had to go back to like when I played football and it was trying to break me, you know, I had to go back. And I'm like, man, I never thought I would get through the stuff that I did. So we're going to get through it. But it's very difficult. And I, and I was kind of like the person. I had to be optimistic. I always said if I had a, 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 a spirit of discouragement, my family would be gone. Because when you, when you get discouraged, then you kind of just do anything to try to make it, you know. And so I would hustle. I mean, I, actually, I had, I had like a consultant business, LLC, you know. <laughs> and I remember um, – not trying to look desperate, so I was. Right. But my 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 fee structure was very high, so I was like a thousand dollars a day. Now here I am, you know, like ain't got money, but I'm like a thousand dollars a day. But every now and again, somehow uh, get it, and so a thousand dollars would go a long way. But I would uh, 
just it was always kind of like upbeat. I just had to stay positive and motivated. And my kids are know the difference because, you know, only thing they know the lights are on and everything. And again, the months turned into months. And then I said, you know what? I think somebody said, you can get food stamps. I didn't even think about food stamps. But I said, man, I can't have my wife go to the welfare office. And I went to the welfare office. And I never thought I'd be in that space at the welfare office getting food stamps, you know. But I, nothing debilitated me. I was never demeaned by stuff, you know. That's the one thing. People get demeaned by things. and They identify with it. Yeah, they identify with it. And they just feel like, oh, man, I can't believe I have to walk. I it was like what I got to do is what I got to do. My mother never bent, and she never cried. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, you know, I told the story of my, my, my daughter. I was reading this book of Job <laughs> for encouragement. Yeah. And people who know the biblical scholars or whoever reads the Bible, they know that Job's story is that he lost everything. Well, yeah. I, and I identify with Job as well. I yeah. mean, because the backstory to that is the devil's like, sure, you have faith in God because everything's right. going well. Mm-hmm. But are you going to have faith when you lose everything? Right. And and so God was like, well, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what yeah. happens. And he loses everything. Right. And the, the real question is, do you maintain your faith when things are bad? That's right. That's right. And that's what it is. That's, those things will strengthen you opposed to looking at it. Uh, you, you're depressed because you're going through it. And the notion that, you know, uh, my wife is pregnant with – my daughter, and what really zapped us a lot is that we, we were on Cobra. So Cobra during that time period was $1,000 a month. And for those listeners, Cobra, when you don't have health insurance through your job, Cobra is kind of like gap insurance, or it, keep, right. it keeps you covered in between jobs, essentially, yeah. but it's very expensive. But, yeah, that's the downside, that, right. that you have, but you've paid a whole uh, – so, so I didn't know about I can get on Medicaid. It was really later after we lost all of our money. We spent all this Cobra money and all this other stuff, you know. But I remember reading the book, and then they said, Job got restored. You know, he got this and got that. And he says he had three daughters. The second daughter was named Kaziah. And I said, man, that's that's my daughter. And so I told my wife, I was so excited. I said, our daughter's name would be Kaziah. Because even though we're in the valley, and it seems like we're going to always be there, we're not going to be here. And so her name is going to, she's going to be a constant reminder of God's faithfulness, right? Yes. And so that was when the breakthrough happened. She was born December 1st, but it wasn't until August that I really got my job at 40% of what I was, we would make wow. it combined, you know? And so, and so here we are 18 years later, my daughter's last one off to school and, you know, got scholarship offers, doing quite well here. And I just say, man, God is faithful, you know, mm-hmm. but I could have easily fainted. I could have bit, I could have buckled. I could have said, you know, people break up. Because of these kind of things, you know, and so for me, it's encouraged because we think about all the stuff that's happened to COVID, people losing their job. I say, yeah, I remember, I was there, and then even when I came up, I was like working at FedEx. I was hustle, so you know, forty percent. So we still got the same bills. So I was blessed. I got the job, right? But I was like uh, <laughs> working at FedEx as a as a uh, box handler. So I, I had the I had the what they call the twilight. <laughs> I was at UPS. From yeah, eleven at night to three in the morning. Yeah. Loading up trucks. So. It was the hardest work I ever done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I want, actually I wound up um, saying, uh, the, the guy who hired me said, you're not going to make it. <laughs> How are you going to make it? They just thought I had a mass. I had a PhD doing this stuff. So but, the, I, but, but the willingness to humble yourself, oh, to yeah. have those credentials and then take a job like that. To do, that's what I'm saying. The hustle by by any means necessary. That's right. And so what I wound up doing, I started writing on a pen name for the, for the Chronicle of Higher Education. And I made more with that one article than I made all that time I was wow. working at FedEx. So I started shifting and saying, what, what, what skill sets do I have? I don't have to just. Not use your body physically. Right. Use your mind. Yeah. And that's some of my, my daughters, they are uh, excellent musicians. They, one's a cellist and one's a violinist. Wow. So I said, why don't you use that? She said, they, but they'd rather babysit. That's the easy part. You, you use your talent. <laughs> <laughs> Babysitting, you know. So so anyway, so basically that's how we got through it. I just, mm-hmm. I, you know, and I reflect on that time period, you know, and I'm like, wow, you know, but I, we got through it. And you got through it. You got back into academia as another faculty role? Yeah. Well, yeah. So basically I, uh, so I always got a story, right? Yeah. So I just started interviewing and I was working in a cave. It was a, gut, it, the, the job was a Literally? Arc. It was a literal cave, right? It was, <laughs> I tell you, I got, 
I'm blessed, right? We might have to make a part two to this. We're just gonna keep rolling, but <laughs> yeah. So, so, <laughs> well, see, it was advertised as an archivist. I said, archivist sounds and I, good. And I said, also, it said health insurance. So it was a federal job, right? So I said, I can stop, you know, paying Cobra, and I can right. be an archivist, you know. So go there, and it's really you just pulling files for the government, and it's in a cave. It's a big cave <laughs> that they painted with files in it, you know. And so that's what I was doing, but I was working full time now, but it was really just making. But it was a government job. But it was making a little bit over minimum wage, okay. right? You know, and then the, the benefits are. But the benefits didn't kick in until another 60 days. Oh, wow. And so I was still at the same place. So I decided, I said, I have to, because I was getting interviews now, right? This is almost a year out of not working. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I got a job with the Army, and it was, it was a job with no benefits, uh, not paying a whole lot. And uh, I just took it, but I kept delaying it. So they said, you had to come in on August 16th. Are we going to, you're not going to have the job. So I'm like, God, I need a breakthrough by the 16th. So this college, and actually in Bronx, Bronx, New York, uh, they called me up and said, we want to interview you. And in the meantime, I interviewed for a position as the, uh, like a, retention specialist or something. It was way, that was past me, you know? But I thought, I said, if I work hard, maybe I can get them to put in that assistant VP because that's why I left. I left as associate VP, you know? So I went to New York. And I go to New York often, but I don't, I was, you know, I go like Times Square, man, you know? Tourist stuff. Tourist stuff, yeah. So I go to this place and they really loving me. They like, you know, we got to interview another person, but, um, you know, when you start? So I called my wife, and they showed show me around the Bronx, right? And this, all due respect to the Bronx, he said, that place is about $3,000. I'm like, that junk. I'm like, stop, <laughs> stop. <laughs> now I'm looking at it as somebody living in New York. <laughs> I'm like, dirt everywhere. <laughs> so I told my wife, I called her up and said, it looked like we're going to be moving to New York. And so she said, call this, this is Catholic school I applied to. She said, call them. This is like on the 14th, I think. Now, keep in mind, on the 16th, something had to happen. And so I called, they, I called this sister who was the provost. She said, uh, we like what you're doing, and so we want to hire you as retention director or something. And I just said, I'm in New York City now. She said, don't take the job. We would like you. We can't pay you what we could pay you. And New York City was six figures, you know? Mm -hmm. And I Your said, expenses are higher. Yeah, right, yeah. You know, and so but this still was a low-paying job. And so she said, and I said, can you make me a system VP of retention? She said, yeah. And she said, I know, Dr. Smith, this is a long stretch. You're in New York, but can you start on the 16th? Because we have our faculty. And I said, wow, God, you, you know what you're doing. Yeah. And so you I called it. <laughs> yeah. And so I started on the 16th. And the day I started, all these different people called me and said they want to hire me. And I always said, you only need one job. That's all I did. I just needed one job. And so when I worked, I worked and worked, and they dropped a, a, a retention part off of it. I became assistant vice president of academic affairs. Then my next job was um, a VP of academic affairs. And I knew I wanted to do something better. So there was a brother. He was actually a frat brother. Mm -hmm. He was the president of the system. And I said, let me talk to him about career stuff. So I, I, I sent him an email and said, can I talk to you about career things? I came in. Did you introduce yourself as frat? At that point? I think I probably did, but it, that would, that didn't lead it, you know. It was just yeah. me being right. um, a person. So I went there. He gave me two pieces of advice. One was good, one wasn't. He said, uh, apply for a VP position. Don't apply for associates. And I had just been on this job less than, I think I was going to my second year. And I'm saying, well, instead of me embracing the advice, and this is a lesson learned for people, instead of me embracing the advice, I started saying how I couldn't do it because I just, be, I just got here. You know, and then I also know when I got here, I was a re it was a retention. <laughs> it was a, and so he said, I don't care. So I looked at his pedigree. He had his first presidency when he was 38. I'm talking about at a predominantly white camp, not at HBCU. And so when he was president of the system, he was on like 47. I mean, he was a young man. So mm -hmm. I saw his curriculum, Vita, and it was like he jumped like two years. So he didn't stay long periods of time. So he made sense of his mind to tell me, you, do, you ju uh, just apply. And so he said, but don't apply to HBCUs because you don't have any HBCU experience. I know how that works. And so mm -hmm. I wasn't going to apply to HBCUs, but guess what? Those are the ones that was giving me 
because uh, who, how old who are you trying to be a, a chief academic officer with less than two years of experience? Took the advice and I became chief academic officer and the VP, then the next provost, then the next to the president, you know? Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, so how did you, let's, let's, move, let's fast forward to who's the tonic because we, yeah. we're, we're grateful to have you here. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, I don't know how it happened. I think it was through Facebook, but I remember when you were first scouting and we connected and you came over. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's, what was the recruitment like? Did you apply for this position or did they seek you out? No, 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 no. So so um, when it's time to move on, it's time to move on. Mm-hmm. I didn't really want to leave Missouri, to be honest. That's a big deal to, to up, uplift your family and move on. Yeah, right, right. And, you know, and so one of the things I think about when I moved, oh, and so I, I have to get over this, right? But And I think I'm over it. But when I moved from one neighborhood in the third grade, to this dilapidated building where we didn't have the heat and everything. Right. It was so traumatic. And then everything kind of shifted in my life. It was, all of a sudden I became a different person in a, in a not a good way. That's when I started daydreaming and dreaming about other things. So I'm putting this on my kids. So when, I was, when it was time for me to move from Kansas City to St. Louis, I was hesitant because my son was a, uh, he was like in seventh grade or eighth grade or something. And I was afraid that if we move, it will disrupt him. Best thing that could have happened. I didn't even know my son was in the theater. He, he was this brilliant singer. He's he had, he's actually an opera singer. He got wow. his he got his two masters from the Boston Conservatory. <laughs> now, if I want to move, because he went to a place where they the, the high school was all about a uh, fine arts, so he was a part of a um, you know uh, one of the top jazz groups in in high school jazz groups in North America, that kind of thing. So that's enough I can look back on and say it turned out okay for him. But in my mind, it's like the girls are different. So when it was time for me, I was president, and I was close to retirement, and I said, it's time for me to move on. And I just started looking. I saw Connecticut. You know, I was like, Connecticut, okay. And I knew I wanted to have a change because all my years have been in four-year institutions. So I thought, let me try Connecticut, you know. And so I didn't really know the, the places or anything. But I locked in on um, Housatonic. So I actually did my research on Bridgeport. Got it. And I said, you know, they had like Bridgeport and Seaport City. I'm like, Seaport City. <laughs> you know? And, you know, and so then it's like, so I looked at Housatonic. Now, this is during COVID, right? So I didn't, I didn't have a chance to even visit. And then I, I was found for another school. I won't mention the school. And so I thought if I could push, put money off the table, which is really a blessing because who does, who puts money off the table? Right. I said, it's about the quality of life. It's about what do I want to expose my, my, uh, Daughter too. So the other place, it was paying much more. I mean, significantly more, but it was in a rural space, and I've been to a rural space. Didn't want to go there, and so I said, whoever chose me first, that's where I'm gonna go. But I was like, who's the tonic? Who's the tonic? Who's the tonic? <laughs> and well, so, you've been manifesting your whole life. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> making but, these affirmations and they come true. Well, actually, what it is, I just say, um, I'm not gonna worry about that. Whatever, right. how it's gonna God's happen, it's gonna happen. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so... Is there a sense of going where you're most needed or where do you think you can make the biggest impact? Well, I think, you know, so I didn't know the variety of issues. So when I retired, so that's a good... I mean, I was able to retire. That's the part I left out. I retired um, in 2020. And my mentor said, uh, Dwayne, the next place you go, you just take your time. You... uh." You retire. You know? It's more of a sunset career. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that. You know, I'm like, I can't go someplace acting like I'm retired. I'm just chill. <laughs> yeah, but so then when I so when I got here, and, and, and this is all good. So I, I run my <laughs> mouth a lot. So when I so when I, they said somebody said congratulations when I was selected, right? Mm. And they said, "Who's the town? Is a great place. They got some problems in Bridgeport." And I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> No, and, and, the, and, the, and the weird part, this is a, Bridgeport is a beautiful place. You know, matter of fact, is. I introduced myself. I'm Dr. Dwayne Smith, uh, CEO of Housatonic Community College in the beautiful city of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I put that in. I think the first time I said people started laughing. I'm like, what's, what's funny about that, you know? And so just the beauty of the place, mm-hmm. the diversity, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's, I, would, I was a point, anointed to be here. You know, and so really for me, I didn't know what I was going to be dealing with. But guess what? My life has always been like this. So whatever, uh, you know, what I see here is been there and done that. 
this is this is I'm gonna say it's easy, but I'm built for this, right? Right. When you hear my story, I'm built for this. Absolutely. Yeah, and I've done this and more. So I'm I, I'm just thrilled about being here. Absolutely. Well, we're fortunate to have you. And yes, I, I fell in love with Bridgeport when I first came here and, and the proximity to New York and the progressiveness yeah. and the the people and I think you're the right man at the right time. Thank you. Thank you. For, you Thank know, you. and kudos on you of just they're your family believing in you. And did you get any resistance at all from them to move, or do they just kind of follow you and trust you that this was the right thing for the family? No. Well, my my son, you know, he went to grad school in Boston. Okay. And so, so, so they I have, have some familiarity with the Northeast. And yeah, but I think what it is is so this is what, uh, kind of a God thing. So my, I was still kind of wanting to stay in Missouri. Mm-hmm. Really, is a fear of moving. I guess you know, or like you know, what, um, not getting out of your comfort zone, or that's kind it. Of, that's uh, it exactly. Yeah. Out of my comfort zone. Yeah. And so I have a uh, my oldest son was was shot. You know, he's an entrepreneur, and he got set up. So basically, he he sell what they call throwback sneakers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so somebody called a woman called him and said, oh, "Hey, wow. uh, we want to get these two whatever it is, you know, and so they're gonna meet." This is in Kansas. They're going to be in some safe place, right? And so we got there with some men. Actually, and got some of these sneakers are v- super valuable and yeah, rare yes. and so forth. So that's that's what it is. So when you realize it was set up, he tried to run. They shot him oh, geez. and took his stuff. And so he was and, – and so basically we thought we was going to lose him. Wow. Because all of his intestines was outside his body. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, and so I thought, okay, you know what? Maybe this is a sign, God, I need to stay in Kansas City, you know? But I realized later that was my son that was in Boston that needed us because he was, you know, he had started school at Alabama State, pledged, pledged a frat, mm-hmm. and then went, went right to grad school. And we only saw him all, over those years, like a couple of twice, you know, because we weren't driving, we weren't flying up to Boston. And so he was so, like, thrilled that we were here, you know. And so um, my daughter, that was the one. So I'm going back here, like, in the third grade, it was very difficult. Now, even God has showed me, hey, your, your son turned out well. I still had a concern about my daughter. Mm-hmm. And so they just they just kind of trust. And I just have a beautiful family where they just trust. And so we went up here. I think the most difficult place, we had like two days to find a place. And so, you know, um, we look in like Cape Cod, and I'm all like, we could get the Cape Cod house. <laughs> Not I told it. you there's a tiny house. I know, uh, but you know, on the <laughs> it, 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 like it's real big on the on the uh, webs, you know. Yeah. And we start looking at it, and they were like looking weird. They were weird homes, you know. Yeah. I mean, I should say weird. They was different from us, right? Right. And I remember uh, the colonial uh, style of, of architecture is different, probably from Midwest and well, Midwest the, the South. I think what it is is that Midwest the uh, the cost of living is much. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, gosh, less expensive. Right. Right. So what you are Buy here or buy a mansion, right? Right. right. So we're thinking, you know, because we leasing because we just got here, you know, Mm -hmm. and so after a while it got really discouraging because I had it all. It's going to be a fun trip. I made some notebooks and I said, check your 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 whatever. We're going to vote and everything. (laughs) By the time it was over, I said, y'all don't have to say nothing. (laughs) I'll make the decision here, and it really messed up everybody. The whole the whole spirit kind of, and I kind of I said I got to apologize. (laughs) I was the one trying to encourage them, you know, like, um, it's going to be fun. And my daughter was crying. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, you know, we wound up in a great place, and I apologize. <laughs> and and so, um, I mean, she did, she's doing well, you know. Like I said, she, you know, she has a 4.8, 5.0 wow. GPA, and she's yeah. in a New Haven Symphony, Youth Symphony That's Orchestra. Awesome. And I remember she was saying that, um, I'm glad we moved here because I wouldn't have looked at these type of schools yeah. if I was not if I was. It all works place. out. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, let's go to who's a tonic. Tell tell us tell our listeners a little bit about this million dollar um, Peter Worth Entrepreneurial Center. That's pretty big news. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we were really fortunate to receive uh, that million dollars. But Peter Worth is really really vested into entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. and this is his first gift like that to a community college and. But he's also always supported Housatonic. So he had actually endowed a half a million dollar for our um, art uh, collection. We have a, a fantastic, um, comprehensive, diverse art collection. I would say, well, it's valued at over $30 million. Wow. Yeah, and this stuff is hanging. Well, I shouldn't say it because, well, I'll just leave it at that. But basically, 
uh, he believes in entrepreneurship. And so we were able to establish that with his gift uh, last semester. And the goal is to create entrepreneurs in various spaces. This has been my love for years. Again, even before I knew what entrepreneurship meant, I just knew that there were always people in the hood, the neighborhood, uh, selling things, trying to make fashion a better way. My, my mother, of course, you know, that's what she did. And even that's what I did as well, you know. And so before I came in Housatonic, basically I was able, we were able to, teamwork, you know. We landed a $2.1 million STEM entrepreneurship uh, grant to look at ways that we can have our STEM scholars to, and these are first generation low wealth individuals to gain access to capital, mm -hmm. gain access to different types of workshops and se sessions to move it beyond the hustle part to really something that they can really look at that can really bring some revenue in. So I had that same sensibility when I got here and that the work was already being done, you know, in terms of talking with Peter Worth, but it all t came in together. And so uh, we have a series of workshops now on like, you know, LLC, LLC, the LCC. Formation of an LLC. Yeah, LLC, yeah, yeah. yeah. Limited liability yeah, corporation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and so um, different ones about your finances. Right. And we call it um, side hustle workshop. You know, like, but but I think the difference now is that we have the resources to to move students beyond, like, this hustle right. to something much bigger. You could bigger. actually make a living. You right, could yeah, make that's a career. it. You that's could, it. You that's could it. Uh, make an impact. That's right. That's right. Um, so that's that's incredible, and I, and I think that that is uh, as one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, the trend of of enrollment numbers going down in universities, yeah. and yeah. and and how you feel that you you're going to address that, or how can how can Husatonic adapt to that? Is it with more entrepreneurial programs, or faster certificate programs, or trades, or what are your thoughts on that? Because the, the idea, I think, let's put it this way. Young people have caught on that they don't want to start life $200,000 in debt, mm -hmm. right? And, and that the, the idea that you're going to go to college and get a job, that's, that's out the window as well. Um, so what is, what is Who's the Tonic doing under your leadership to address those things? I, I think that we have to uh, change the narrative. So really, uh, just in the same way, you can buy a Bentley, and pay, what, $200,000 for a Bentley. But you don't have to have a Bentley to get to and fro, right? right. You get a used car, you can get a car for $200, really. And so when you think about the landscape for higher education, there's all types of institutions. And so at Housatonic, as well as the other uh, institutions or the other 11 community colleges, our, our fee structure is low. So basically about $5,000 a year and if you and if you get a, a a Pell grant, that can cover that. And we have the PAC program in Connecticut, so it's basically free uh, college for those students who go full time. So, for, so first of all, there's no excuse, you know, that whole notion that it costs too much. But really, that's where the persistence come in. You know, really talking about what do you need to do in order to get to where you go, and that's where my story comes in handy because they just see me as the CEO. You don't know about this game. They don't know. I do. <laughs> I've been there. It probably worse. <laughs> worse. And this is why I am. Right. Right. And so and that's I think what, that's a yeah. that's a perspective. I think that in the past we've we've envisioned university presidents as like sitting in an ivory tower, mm -hmm. privileged life, don't identify with yeah. today's college student. But yeah. your story, your testimony is something that you you can certainly have empathy for today's college student. Oh yeah, but also I don't have any excuses for them. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. So, you know, you can't tell me anything <laughs> about what you're talking about, you know. So I think it's like really changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. But I think that what's happening now is that, well, of course, COVID, you know. But yeah. even pre-COVID, usually numbers increase when there's like uh, like a, a economic fallout. Right. So in 2012, this is right after the, the uh, meltdown, uh, we had a big rush. People lose their jobs. They, they come in. But then when things are better they don't have a need for education but i know um not from um research i know personally how education can change a trajectory for years to come mm -hmm. so even at Housatonic, we had to tell the story more that even just with a Housatonic, i said such even more but with a Housatonic associate degree we say collectively we graduate about four or five hundred students 
me, I'm a low wealth, first generation. They have a lifetime earnings collectively over $2 billion. You know, and I think that sometimes people are like, I want to be able to buy a mansion. You know, but basically I just say people just want to be able to pay their bills, mm -hmm. have a little money left over to kind of have some fun, maybe go on vacation, buy their kids some clothes, and maybe have money for Christmas. And that's what basically people live their lives like that. And so having an education will allow you to do that. But it also allow you to grow more than that. And so uh, in terms of enrollment, we got to tell that narrative. You know, people say that not everybody needs a college degree. I cringe at that. Because if you would looked at my family. Or college isn't for everyone. But, you know, they don't, tell, but they don't tell their kids that. Right. <laughs> They'll tell your kids that. <laughs> But they're not going to tell their kids right. that. Their kids could be in school for 10 years. Or uh, Johnny going to graduate, you know, and, and then, you know, well, maybe you need to try something different. And so I, that's why I, I, don't, I shall never forget my journey because I'm saying is I remember when we were in front of that, this torn down building, which is our home, there was no grass. It was just dust. So we were playing. We have dust everywhere, you know. And somebody could have walked past there and said, you know what, they amount, never amount to anything. Because they saw the surface but didn't know the internal part of it, you know. And so even now, I, I, when I, I talk to people, I'm like, you know, I met with somebody the other day and they said, um, I just have, uh, I, I, got, I dropped out of high school, I'm like, I have a GED. And, you know, you could go back and get a, 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 a degree, you know. My, my godmother, and I, and I love her stuff, my godmother she had, she, she dropped out of high school when she was 15, but she was pregnant. By age 22, she had six kids. Wow. Age 28, she had eight. She finally got her tubes tied, right? And she went to the descent of uh, mainly alcohol. She became an alcoholic and some drugs too. And she decided that she wanted to get sober. So this year, she just celebrated 40 years of sobriety. Wow. Never picked up a Praise drink. God. Never picked up a drink. And when her mind got clear, her mind was made up, her mind changed. She said, I want to go back and get my GED. So she went back and got her GED. She said, I want to, I, I want to go further. She went back and got her associate's degree. And then she got her back, baccalaureate BS degree. And, she, and, and so at age, she'll be 80 this year. At age 79, she ran for public office and won. Wow. And so when, so when people say, well, I got kids, I, you know what? And that's what I would tell her. You there know, are no I, excuses. We learned yeah, that. Yeah, I was a young man, and she was my godmother. And she would call, like, with every tragedy, like, I mean, son, grandson got shot, so-and-so got killed. I said, you continue. You continue, you know? And so that's really the, the, the thing that we have to in, inspire people like that. And I think that there's less inspiration because there's so much clutter out there, all this discussion, talk. But I say to my people here at Housatonic, it's like we're like fishermen in the ocean with all these fish. There's no reason why we should not get our, our, our numbers up. Right. You know? So, and I was out actually at the Puerto Rican Day Parade. I'm out there passing out, you know, uh, little Housatonic <laughs> postcards. You know, I humble myself, right? What president going out there? passing out and they like no no thank you brother i'm just going to the crowd <laughs> a that fisher was, of men yeah that's what we need to do yeah 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 so how what's the best way for people to find out more about the programs at, at who's a tonic how do they reach you um learn about the entrepreneur center um you know or yeah. or even just paint a picture of the ideal it sounds like college is for everyone Everybody, we have different, we have certificate programs. We have um, uh, advanced manufacturing programs, actually yeah. working with the school districts. Uh, we have two-year degrees that transfer to four-year institutions. We have it all, and these are all stackable. So if you get a, a certificate, you can also continue and get an uh, associate's degree. But I'm going to give them my personal number okay, and just tell them that I was on uh, Peralto show. <laughs> yeah. Mission control. Yeah. Okay, that's what it's called. I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, we know we're all about branding here. So. He's like, mission control. <laughs> <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on mission control. <laughs> so tell me you, you, you heard me on mission control. And the number is 
332-5222. That's my office to the CEO's office. But then if you want to learn more about the Work Center, you can call uh, 203-520-8051 or just reach us at www.husatonic.edu. You'll find all the information about enrollment, about who we are, the different types of activities, what makes Husatonic special. In this community. Right. And then the Worth Center, you mentioned the Side Hustle Workshop. It's open to students and members of the public. Yeah, well, we, we, we want to focus on the, the, the students, kind of get them going. But if there's a public member, like a community member that wants yeah. to do that, you can call and we can try to work it out. Yeah. And I like to come into one of those because my book is launching, which oh, is wow. Launch Your Brand, right. which yeah, is designed yeah. for people with side hustles that want to start yeah. their own companies. So we'll talk. We'll, we'll, uh, We'd we'll love to do a book signing event at one of those workshops. I would love it. You know, and, and I'm proud that you are on our board. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. The Who's the Tonic Community College Foundation yes. uh, is I'm the newest, one of the newest board members. So I'm really honored. Well, we're honored to have you. I mean, it's like everyone got excited when they heard you. So you're a man with a <laughs> reputation. <laughs> I'm in the branding business. So I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. And, and, it, and I'm putting in a lot of work. I've been in Bridgeport 30 years and, yeah. and, uh, just love the city and and um, identify with his with his people and yeah. and uh, believe that like you like yourself that we've been we've all been through adversity and it's getting through and sure. continuing. Yeah. Um, why don't you leave our listeners with with a bit more of inspiration? Not that you've already done enough, but give us give our listeners, our entrepreneurs, and people out there maybe thinking of you know what they can become and and uh, what they can do with themselves. Give them a little bit of inspiration. Uh, w- one of the things, you know, and you're familiar with this, is that you have to think high to rise. Yes. You got to be sure of yourself before you ever win the prize. You got to think high. So what that means is that you have to transform your mind. And the Bible says transform yourself by the renewing of your mind, meaning making your mind new. Think differently about who you are. And when you do that, and not be afraid of failure. You know, I, I, that's the thing that for me that's really powerful is that there were failures before there were successes, you know, but I was, you know, um, I was not afraid to fail. And I wasn't afraid uh, to go places that you wouldn't expect you to go. So, again, really working in the cave with a PhD, working at FedEx, with a PhD, but what that did, that prepared me for my launch to go to the next level. I never criticized the process. I never said, why me? I think one time, and I'll say this, is that when I took a chance and I left my first school, I've been there 16 years, and I figured that if I don't leave, and my, my position was I was associate dean of multicultural affairs, and I was a young brother, but I said, if I don't leave here, I'm going to die as a social dean and multicultural fair, they're going, I'm going to retire, and they're going to give me the key to the city and say, good job. <laughs> he handled the black folk well. And so I took a chance. I, I quit. You know, didn't have a job, but I decided to go back and get my doctorate. So my next job, I was a non-tenure faculty member, and I was making thousand dollars less with a Ph.D., and I remember I was part of this grant, and this grant was in uh, the urban area of Kansas City. And I would go there, and I was supposed to teach. I'm not. It was I was just part of. I was a hustle. I was trying to get some money because I was I had a nine month faculty contract, and the kids were going all kind of places. And I'm used to dealing with college students. These were like fifth graders, and they didn't want to be there because it was a summer program. And I remember I would get there before early, and they didn't have the church locked up, and I sat there and said. Why did I leave that place? And it was almost like God was saying, don't ever look back. Mm-hmm. And I never, from that point, I never looked back. So whatever difficulty happened, because if I look back and say, boy, if I would have stayed there, I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have, I would, would not have lost my job. I wouldn't have to be on food stamps. But guess what? 20 years from a date that I, 20 years from a date that I left that place, I became president. My first presidency, you know. So never look back. Amen. We're going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for being here. Yes, 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 yes. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mission Control. Until next time, this is Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design and We Launch Brands.
Thank you for taking this journey with us. To learn more about Peralta Design and our work, go to www.peraltadesign.com and subscribe to keep up with the crew.